Yahweh, God, is breaking into our world, into our everyday reality, rescuing his created people to restore them, to bring them back into relationship with him. This unstoppable God who will stop at nothing to save his people. That's what we saw last week in uh, this first half of chapter 40 in Isaiah. Unstoppable God breaking in to this exile existence of his people Israel as they're exiled in Babylon, announcing that he is coming, that he is returning, that he sees their problems, their issues, their situation, and he is returning to rescue them out of love and grace. And if there's one thing that will stop that from happening, or if there's one thing that will keep the people from experiencing this new reality that God wants to create of restoring relationship and bringing people back into relationship with him, if there's one thing that is going to keep the people from experiencing that, it's their idolatry. God is breaking into our world today, into our very existence, into our everyday lives to rescue us from our situation of slavery to sin, to free us and to restore us to himself. And the one thing that will keep us from experiencing that is our idolatry. God is breaking into the world to rescue this unbelieving world that is all around this hillside community church to reveal his glory. And he's calling us into this partnership of ministry with him, the living God of the universe. He's calling us as people into this partnership, this ministry of working with him to reveal his glory to this unbelieving world, to shine his light into this very dark world. That's an amazing opportunity that we have to partner with the living God of the universe. And if there's one thing that will hinder us, that will keep us from participating in that mission of God, it's our idolatry. We're putting other gods first. And some of you may be thinking in this moment, well, what the heck do you mean, Pastor Jeff? Last time I checked, I am not worshiping idols. I'll just pose the question, what do you worship? Everyone worships. What do you worship? Worship is not just limited to this hour on Sunday morning between here at Hillside between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. The way we live our life 24-7, 365 days a year, that is our worship. So I'll ask again, what do you worship? Let's dive into uh, the second half of Isaiah chapter 40. Um, we'll pick up at verse 12. Um, I'm going to read the whole passage to the end, and then we'll just kind of jump back in and, and, and dive into some specific um, verses and, and passages within the second half of Isaiah chapter 40. But we'll start at verse 12 if you want to follow along. Um, this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. 
To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it. And a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he, Yahweh, God of the universe, blows on them and they wither. And the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. See all the stars in the sky, in the universe. Who created these? Who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name? By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's the word of the Lord for today. Basically, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah and and making it abundantly clear, crystal clear, how idiotic it would be to worship anything other than God. How idiotic that would be to worship anything other than God because it is God and God alone who created everything that we see around us. He created it. He filled it. He brought life to it. He created life. He breathed into each one of us and brought us to life. He holds everything in the palm of his hand. Nations as mighty and as powerful as they may be are nothing before God who just can simply blow on them and they wither and fade and fall away. God who created the stars and put them in the sky, knows each one and even calls them by name. So how idiotic is it to worship anything or anyone else? Why would you create an idol? Why would you bow down before a worthless, empty, piece of wood or stone or gold or silver and worship that. When this God is your God and this God, this unstoppable God, wants to partner with you in revealing his glory to the world and making him visible to the world, why would you worship anything else? Why all this prohibition against idols? It's all throughout Scripture. It's constantly brought up. Um, You read, you know, read the book of Kings, read Chronicles, read any of the prophets, and they are constantly talking about worshiping idols and God coming in and saying, don't do that. You know, stop worshiping these idols, these other gods. 
turn back to me. I mean, it's a constant running theme all throughout scripture. Why this prohibition against idols? I mean, it starts all the way back in, as Nancy already pointed out, back in Genesis or in Exodus of the Ten Commandments, when God um, handed down those first um, 10 laws and gave them to Moses to give to the people. And one of them is right there. It says, you know, you shall not make a carved image or any other likeness of anything. So it goes back to the Ten Commandments. It starts right there, God prohibiting that. But what was it really about idols that was so bad? It's important for us to remember the context in the ancient Near Eastern world. An idol's primary function was not to physically represent what a deity or a god looked like. It wasn't necessarily about, you know, just having something to look at to be able to see what this god looks like. The primary function of an idol was to, it was the primary locus or the medium, if you will, for the deity to manifest himself or herself in the world. The idol becomes the vehicle, if you will, for the god or goddess to manifest himself or herself in the world. This was the way through the idol through which that god or goddess came into the world. That's why you don't mess around with idols. It's not just having a picture to look at of what this guy looks like. It is the thought, the thinking was by standing before an idol, you are literally standing in the physical presence of this other god or goddess, and that you do not do. How did God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, promise to make himself visible? How, what was the vehicle that God used to make himself manifest, present, visible in the world? What was it? Through Jesus and through his, his spirit, and through his people. God promised, I mean, that is, you know, God promised that he was going to reveal his glory, and he was going to reveal his glory through his people. God chose Israel. They're the chosen people for a reason, because through them, God is going to reveal his glory to the world. Through this chosen people, God is going to make himself visible in the world. And yes, then, because we know the rest of the story, the New Testament, God sends his son Jesus, who is God, fully human, fully divine, through whom God is literally made visible and made manifest, and through the outpouring of his Holy Spirit upon who? Upon us, his people, who have accepted him and who have chosen to believe in him, who are now forgiven and redeemed and filled with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, anointed with the Spirit of God, now we become the living body of Christ in the world today. For what purpose? To reveal God's glory in the world, to make God visible in the world so that an unbelieving world can come to know him and experience him and come to believe in him and live in a life-saving relationship with this God. It is through us, his people, that God chooses to make himself manifest. We are God's imagers. We're literally created in the image of God, and we are filled with God's Holy Spirit, empowered to reveal God in, in the world so that people can see God through us, so that people can experience God through us. So I guess I ask again the question I start off with, what do you worship? Who do you worship? Our worship is not just this hour on Sunday morning. Our worship is our life. 
how we live life 24-7, 365 days a year, that is our worship, which allows, hopefully, the world to see and experience God in and through us. What does the world see when they look at you? What does the world see when they look at you? Do they see God? Or do they see something else? When the world looks at you, do they see a loving, caring person who takes care of widows and orphans? Do they see a person who reflects grace and love and truth? Do they see a person who, who loves and forgives? Do they see a person who worships God with all their heart and mind and soul? Or do they see a person who worships idols, who worships something or someone else? Or do they see themselves? What does the world see when they look at you? A worshiper of God or a worshiper of idols? This is not a guilt trip ser uh, sermon. Um, I raise the issue because it's extremely important. It gets right to the heart of who we are as God's people and right to the heart of what our mission is is in the world is why we exist as God's people. It, gets, it's, it is that important. And I think it touches on our, our, our everyday experience. Um, as I was, as we were um, moving in to the parsonage back, what, oh, has it been two months now? Uh, no, not quite. Um, and we were in the, the, the big U-Haul was being unloaded. Someone literally made the comment, well, we know what Pastor Jeff's idol is now. I wrestle with this because there was some truth in that comment. I mean, it was, I think it was a joke, but there was some truth in that as we unloaded box after box after box, 60 pound boxes of records and books that are literally now set up in a special room in the, in the parsonage down in the basement with special shelves just for records and a special shelf just for the stereo. It's like a little um, temple to the gods of rock or <laughs> the gods of vinyl. I don't know how we want to look at that. The, God, the music gods, you know. It's my sanctuary. I love to go down there and hang out when I have time and put records on and listen to music and, you know, just get away for a little bit. One could well make the case that that is literally Pastor Jeff's idol. It's his temple to other gods right there in the basement of the parsonage. It's, I, I spend money on it. I spend time on it. One could make the argument that it lures my heart away from God briefly. We have all kinds of American idols don't we? We literally have a TV show with that label. We have all kinds of American idols. Idols, anything that takes the place of God in our lives. An idol is literally, it's not necessarily, just as Nancy's already alluded to, a carven image, you know, a statue made of gold or silver or stone of some other god. But an idol becomes anything in our lives that we look to or use to fill the empty spaces in our lives, to fill the holes in our hearts or in our minds that only God can fill. That becomes an idol. And we have all kinds of American idols because we use things like money and power and beauty and sex and drugs, and alcohol to fill the empty spaces in our hearts and in our lives that only God can fill. Why do we have these idols that we worship? 
I think a lot of that idol worship comes down to an effort to mask pain and fear. We might go without next month, so I better work 80 hours a week this month and bank all that money and store it all up so that if something happens on down the line, I won't have to worry, I'll have enough. And we work and we work and we work and we work and we pile it up and accumulate it like Scrooge more than we could ever really need, but in fear of what might happen, we accumulate and we accumulate. We worry and we fear about what other people think about us, and so we just, you know, beauty and taking care of ourselves and making us, you know, look good, so that or we begin to think and feel inside that, well, I am ugly, so beauty becomes an idol that we worship. We fear that other people may have power over us, and so we position ourselves and we put ourselves in places where we will have power so that no one can take advantage of us. So I'm not going to let anyone take advantage of me, so I'm going to make sure that I have the power in this position or in this relationship, and power becomes an idol that we essentially worship we begin to think that maybe I'm unlovable, that because of my past, the things that I've done, the things that I've said, the mistakes that I have made, I am unworthy, I am unlovable. And we fill those empty spaces with anything, relationships, with sex, with drugs, with alcohol, anything that will fill the gap that will fill the hole and make us feel good or whole. And ultimately, I would argue, I think, don't we all have some kind of fear of death? That's the ultimate reality on down the line for all of us. One day, this body is going to, the heart's going to stop beating and the lungs are going to stop breathing, and it's going to die. Don't we fear that? The knowledge that really all I am is dust, and to dust I shall return. So all of these things, the accumulation of wealth and possessions and power and beauty, becomes a mask to cover up the pain or the fear. Or maybe I just got all that wrong and basically we're just self-centered, selfish human beings who will, just, who will stop at nothing to make sure that we feel good and have fun and have everything that we want. And we wander around like God can't see it. My way is hidden from the Lord. Or my right is disregarded by my God. But the Lord does know. And the Lord does see. The Lord does understand. Even loves. So why do we say, oh Jacob, why do we say, Oh, people of hillside, my way is hidden from the Lord. My right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord, Yahweh, is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God gives power. God increases strength. God, and only God, renews 
and restores. God and only God provides and fills. God and only God rescues and resurrects. God and only God. So why would we worship anything or anyone else? God, unstoppable God, who loves you so deeply because you are his creation, because you are his child, his son or his daughter. God loves you. And God continually is moving to position himself in a way so that you and he can have this close, personal, intimate relationship through which we experience the fullness of God, the fullness of life that God intends for us, the abundant life that God has for us. But that full life, that abundant life, is the opposite of what we oftentimes think of as full and abundant. It is not dependent upon wealth. It is not dependent upon things. It is simply dependent upon this love and grace that God has for us and gives to us and shows to us. It's simply about this one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship which leads to new, full, and eternal life. And God wants to have that relationship with the entire world. And this unstoppable God is moving into that unbelieving world, positioning himself to reveal his glory in and through us as his people, that the world may be saved and all people may experience that love that forgiveness, that grace, and experience that new, full, and eternal life. He wants to do that with us, through us. Our idolatry will take us out of the game, if you will. Our idolatry will be one thing that will hinder us that will keep us, that will prohibit us from that partnership in ministry and in mission with the God of the universe. So I ask again, what do you worship? When the world looks at you, what do they see? The good news here is that God is continually calling us back into that relationship to turn away from the idols that we put up in our lives, to turn away from our own sinfulness and selfishness, and to return to him, to move again into relationship with him. Return to the Lord. Return to the Lord. Say yes to anything and everything that God calls you into. It might be working as a trustee here at the church. It might be teaching little kids about Jesus. It might be caring for a widow or an orphan, revealing love and grace, serving them in a way that makes it possible for them to experience love and truth and grace. It may be just simply in the line of the grocery store with that random stranger to share a word of comfort or grace or love. It may be talking to that coworker at work who's maybe you've invited them to come to church a thousand times and they've said no every time, but the thousand and one, the thousand and first time is going to be the time when they say yes. Our worship is not just what we do here on Sunday morning. Our worship is how we live life 24-7, 365 days a week.
our prayer is that when the world looks at us, they don't see us. And they definitely don't see a reflection of themselves. But what they see is the living God. That what they see is the living Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are calling us into um, relationship with you, into partnership with you, as you go about your mission of revealing your glory to the world. Lord, we confess in this moment that sometimes we do have idols in our lives, things that get in the way of our relationship with you, things that we use to try to fill the holes and the gaps in our lives that only you can fill. We confess this to you now in this moment, and we ask for your forgiveness. Forgive us for our idol worship. We want to return to you. Lord, we repent and we return to you. Holy Spirit, fill us, anoint us, empower us, that this week as we go forth into the world, the things that we say, the things that we do, will reflect your presence, will reveal your glory, will enable people to see you and to experience your love and your grace and to come into relationship with you into new, full, and eternal life. Guide us, direct us, empower us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. As, we, as the sign on the door reminds us, as we enter into that parking lot and into that world, we enter into the mission field. May we reveal God's glory, his love, his truth, and grace this week. Holy Spirit, bless you and anoint you, fill you and empower you. Amen.